The Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California presents a homily by chaplain for the Sims Man UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology, Michael Esselin, titled Holding On and Letting Go, recorded on Sunday morning, May 30th, 2021. Good morning. And welcome to worship at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. I'm worship associate Celia Ortenberg serving you this morning while our minister, Dana Warsnop, is out of the pulpit. I'm joined today by worship associate Andy, Andy Edgar Beltran. And together we welcome you to this virtual space that is made sacred by our, by our presence together. Today, we have one of our favorite speakers, um, Michael Esselin, whom I will introduce in just a moment. But first, I want to give you a heads up about next Sunday's service. Next Sunday is a question box service where Dana will answer as many of your questions as she can in 20 minutes. So submit your questions um, before noon on Saturday via the UUCV This Week this week email um, where you can read just a bit more about that service. So that'll be a lot of fun. But now let me introduce you to Michael. Michael Esselin serves as the chaplain for the Sims Man UCLA Center for Integrate Integrative Oncology. A two-time TEDx speaker, Michael speaks extensively to healthcare professionals, patient populations, and faith communities across the country. He's also worked as an activist educator addressing LGBTQ bias in the larger community for over 30 years. Michael was recently inducted into the UCLA Semmel Institute um, Eudaimonia Society in recognition for having lived a meaning driven life. He has four volumes of CDs available for purchase. So you can contact Michael through his website, www.michaelesselin.com. Um, or you can talk to him about that when in a breakout room after the service. And we are so thrilled to have you again with us once again, Michael. Good morning. I'm worship associate Andy Edgar Beltran. I hope everyone here has a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. As we come together in community in this virtual space, we are very aware of all of which we have to, had to let go, not the least of which at the most basic level, coming into physical presence with one another. As we light our own chalices or candles, if we choose to represent the chalice of our community, we're mindful of this sacred time of coming together on our shared journey of discovery, discovery of that which remains essential after we have had to let go of so much. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. As a call to worship this morning, I'd like to offer this reflection by Richard Rohr. How am I ready to surrender? I believe profoundly in the necessity of surrender, but I don't think we can chart its course ahead of time. Our own private salvation projects seldom do the job. Surrender is something that is done to us more than something we do ourselves. In Joseph Campbell's book on the hero's journey, he says that the only way to be a hero is to prepare and be ready for when the moment comes. You might say that is the point of all spirituality. Someone else must determine the timing, the circumstances, the shape of the ordeal. None of us can engineer our own transformation or it would not be transformation at all, but merely cosmetic surgery to make us think well of ourselves. You can't choose ahead of time which dragon you'll slay or how you'll slay it. It will probably slay you. So just make sure you are well practiced in dying. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Bierke, the music director. 
I'd like to invite you to join me in singing our opening hymn, Gather the Spirit. going to share a beautiful book called Golden Threads, written by Suzanne Del Rizzo and illustrated by Mika Sato. But first, I am wondering if anyone out there has ever fallen down or hurt themselves. Yeah, me too. I wonder if any of you have any scars to show for your hurts or stories about them. Well, this story is told through the voice of a little stuffed fox and what happens to him when he gets hurt and what happens to his scars. And if you pay close attention to the pictures, you'll see that someone else is hurt and then they get better. Golden Threads. Home. High on a mountain under our glorious ginkgo tree, happily tucked in the crook of my Emmy's elbow. It was all I'd ever known until the day of the storm. The first golden leaf, Emmy had said, placing it inside my pocket. Ginkgo's crown shimmered, waving to us in the sunshine. Behind it, gray clouds puffed and the wind began to whistle. At the tea house, Obasan greeted us with a warm cup of twig tea. Plip, plip, plip. More rain, said Obisan. Plip, 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 platter, patter. Suddenly, the rain's pattering glue into a whirring roar and crack. Snatched by a falling branch, I plunged head over paw. I churned and lurched a blur of ragged fur and froth. And finally, I stopped. Day turned into night like a trail of floating ginkgo leaves. The moon's reflections pointed toward home. But finally, I was found but not by my Emmy. Kiko, 
A friend has come to visit, the old man said, guiding a girl's hand to rest on my mattered head. Kiko washed away the mud and puckered and plucked seeds nestled deep in my fur. She sniffed their sweet woody scent. You're a long way from home, from your pine forest, she said. And what treasure the fox brings, said Oji, Oji-san. Kiko touched my tattered paws and battered fur. You must be missed. How can I go on like this, I tried to yell. Will Emmy ever want me now? But all that came out was a tiny frothy bubble. I know, Kiko whispered as she darned my fur, mending it with tiny golden stitches. And the seasons passed. And whiffs of spring floated through the window, smelling of my mountainside home. What a beautiful day, said Kiko. The scent of the buttercups and mountain flocks pulled us down the path. Mmm, said Kiko, breathing in the beauty. And my stuffing puffed up and I could feel the strength of my golden seams. And we were happy. Down in the valley, autumn's frosty gusts returned. Golden speckles rippled against the shoreline. A golden leaf, asked Kiko, tracing its scalloped edges from your home. She tucked it inside my pocket and whispered, I'll miss you. And following the trail, the floating trail of glimmering leaves, we rode across the lake. In the distance, I saw my Giko tree standing tall, triumphant, despite one broken bough. Hands traced my golden, golden stitching and flipped my floppy ear. You came home, squealed Emmy, hugging me and Kiko tight. Kiko peeled off the leaf from my pocket. This showed us the way. Beneath our golden ginkgo, we sipped warm tea and one by one, we pieced together the fragments of my journey. My, stitches, my stitched stuffed chest was like a seed, paw, seed pod filled full to the brim, grateful, restored, and loved. And that's a beautiful book. And at the end of this book, the author shares with us a story, the story, how this story touches the beautiful Japanese art form of Kintsuko and the ancient philosophy of wabi-sabi. In Kintsuko, broken pottery is repaired with seams of resin that are then painted with gold. And the gold filled cracks tell the story of a once broken item and give it new value. And this is an example of the Japanese idea of wabi-sabi, which means finding beauty in things that are imperfect or incomplete. We all fall down, we feel broken, but the stories that we have to tell from our experiences make us stronger. Mending with gold teaches us that if we choose to embrace our struggles and repair ourselves with gratitude and love, we become beautiful for having been broken. So remember that all of your hurts and scars, along with all of the other things in your life, help make you who you are and that you are all perfectly beautiful, scars and all. Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our collection to an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people in our own church. We now invite you to donate online. 
you'll see the link on the next slide, which will also be posted in the chat as a direct link. Our offering today goes to the Lift Up Your Voice to End Homelessness Motel Fund to provide folks with a few nights in a motel when they need it most. One recent weekend, a case manager called asking us to help with a motel stay for a mom who had to get out of her house immediately to escape domestic violence. The case manager was going to help her get a restraining order, but she could not get it done on the weekend. We gave the mom, her two daughters, and two grandchildren three nights in a motel in a different city and a gift card for a local grocery store. As planned, the case manager helped with the restraining order then mom, daughters, and grandchildren all went back home. And because authorities had gotten the abuser out of the house, they were able to keep their housing and stay in their apartment. We are grateful that donations like this one, like this one today mean we can help with such needs arise. Thank you for giving generously as you always do. Winter is the oldest season, but quietly beneath the snow, seeds are stretching out and reaching, faithful as the morning glow, caring nothing but what you must. Tomorrow beckons. Lean in toward the light. Keep practicing resurrection. Lean in toward the light. The shadows of this world they'll say there's no hope. Why try anyway? Every kindness, large or slight, shifts the balance for the light. Rivers wind and open wide. Lean in toward the light. Don't just walk when you can fly. Lean in toward the light. When justice seems in short supply. Lean in toward the light. Let beauty be your truest guide. Lean in toward the light. Shadows of this world will say, There's no hope, why try anyway? Every kindness, large or slight, shifts the balance toward the light. The prayer I pray at even time, all left undone be put aside. Lean in. When forgiveness is hard to find, lean in toward the light. Help me at least to be kind, lean in toward the light. Lean in toward the light. Lean in toward the light. Lean in toward. We're always deeply grateful for the generosity of this congregation. Your gifts are golden threads that run throughout this community and keep us connected to one another and to the broader world. Each week we lift up the joys and sorrows that have been shared with this community. You can submit a joy and or a sorrow to be shared in one of two ways. Every Thursday, the email bulletin UUCV this week includes a link for sharing joys or sorrows. Or you can use the joys and sorrows link at our website, uuventura.org. 
Messages that are shared by 10 p.m. on Saturday will be read in the service the following morning. Those received after 10 p.m. on Saturday will be shared the following Sunday. When we're together in our physical sanctuary, we drop stones in water for each joy or sorrow. The ripples that go out represent the ways in which a joy or a sorrow that touches the heart of one of us travels throughout our community to touch us all. Today, the ripples we see on our screen are virtual, but know that the connections they re represent are still very real. I invite you all now to speak aloud or in your heart the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize or those who may be in need of the loving embrace in this community. We also now invite you to type the names into our Zoom chat by invoking their names, even when they may not hear them, you bring them into this circle of caring that we call community. We hold these names, spoken and unspoken, in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. Please join me in singing Voice Still and Small. I invite us to close our eyes and get comfortable in our seats as we move into this time of silent reflection and contemplation. As we breathe a few nice deep breaths together, we quiet our minds. We let go of the concerns of the day and the week behind us and the week ahead of us. And we simply follow the empty breath Richard Rohr asserts his belief in the necessity of surrender, of letting go. As we move gently into our communal silence, we also move into a space of surrender to that which is beyond our control. And we open ourselves to a peace that just may be waiting for us there.
before Lord God May the sea and the land He held all the stars In the palm of his hand They run through his fingers Like grains of sand And one little star fell alone So the Lord God hunted through the white night air For the little dark star on the wind down there And he stated and promised to take special care So it wouldn't get lost again Now a man the mine if the stars grow dim and the clouds flow over and darken him so long as the Lord God's watching over him, keeping track of how it all goes on. But I've been walking all the night and the day Till my eyes get weary and my head turns grey And sometimes it seems maybe God's gone away Forgetting the promise that we've heard Him say And we lost out here in the stars Little stars, big stars Blowing through the night And we lost out here in the stars Blowing through the night And we'll last out here in the stars Beautiful. Our reading this morning is In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds and every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever heard in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. A well-known Buddhist author and teacher, Pema Chodron offers us this in her book, When Things Fall Apart. I used to have a sign pinned to my wall that read, only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation, can that which is indestructible be found in us. It was all about letting go of everything. I invite you to think about four or five things that make you who you are, 
that if anyone is going to know you at all, they're gonna know these four or five things about you, that you're a gifted artist, you're a talented athlete, you're passionate about your faith community or politics, you're a devoted parent or grandparent. Perhaps you're known for your beautiful physique and your great head of hair. That would be me. Imagine none of that is true anymore or not in the same way. Who would you even be then? Is there an essential you who dwells beneath all those labels with which we would identify under all those hats we might wear? What's more, is he or she worthy of love? Is he or she capable of giving love? As painful as it may be to entertain those questions, they do reflect a most profound spiritual journey through loss toward essence, if you will, that which is indestructible. It's a journey that so many cancer patients must take in a compressed, accelerated kind of fashion, watching piece by piece of one's identity slowly slip away. If I'm no longer the super mom who never misses a soccer game or a birthday party, who would I even be then? Would I even still be the mom? The thing is, it's a journey we all must take. Life affords us each that guarantee we will all lose everything. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we love. How do we make peace with that? Is it even possible? I sometimes wonder if one key to living a successful life dwells within our capacity to come to peace with the inevitability of loss. What's more, might that peace even be a kind of gift, a kind of blessing, giving us a glimpse every now and then into that which is indestructible. The Buddhists would caution us to be well-practiced at letting go, that holding on, grasping, clinging are sure pathways to suffering. We only have to look as an illustration at how so many of us have been coping with this unfolding pandemic. I just want my old life back. I want to get back to normal. How long is this going to last? I'm an avid swimmer. I swim every day. And I remember over a year ago, March 16th, 2020, when my gym announced that because of the virus, they would be closing for up to two weeks. Two weeks? I can't live without the pool for two weeks? Oh, yeah? Just wait. I hear similar sentiments sometimes from newly diagnosed cancer patients. Can't we just go back to the way things were six weeks ago? It's a kind of paradox, really, that yes, holding on can lead to suffering, but I find there's also life force in it, in the reaching, in the yearning, in the longing. Chemo infusion clinics are filled with patients who have signed up for guaranteed suffering, for the possibility of more time more life. Universities are filled with students investing in striving for creating a future. When we're young, the future is almost a member of the family, a character in our own biography. Look at how much attention and intention we invest in the future. It shapes almost every decision we make. As we get older, possibility diminishes right along with the future and the past becomes a far richer member of the family. Memories, stories, stories that might soothe us, bring us peace, or stories that might just as soon haunt us, but either way, stories that offer the possibility of meaning. In the saddest irony of all, some of us will even lose those in time. How do you make peace with that? Is there any meaning to be found in everything that we will lose? I am not so arrogant as to think I have any answers at all. What I have are stories, both my own and those of countless patients I've walked beside, patients whom I was just as soon call my teachers. And I have a growing faith at this stage of my life that drawing closer toward any paradox and holding the space for two competing realities to be true might just offer a pathway to peace, if not wisdom. 
April was a great gal, mid forties, vibrant, professional, wife, mom, two great kids. She also had this exceedingly rare, exceedingly lethal cancer diagnosis that also happened to be horribly disfiguring. The doctors gave her that awful assessment, nothing more to be done. She greeted that news with this kind of clarity and profundity, Michael, I'm dying, I know that. It's the truth, but you know what? It's only one truth of many truths. Her openness to that statement and her willingness for it to shape the remainder of her days was truly something to behold. And there are those who cling so valiantly to those one or two aspects of their identity that without them, life simply wouldn't be worth living. That clinging actually keeps them going. There's the passionate university professor who by any reasonable standard should never have been in a classroom, given how immunocompromised she was and how weak she was, but even her oncologist saw the truth. I see that this is who you are. You're a teacher, you've got to do it. So go teach, just be careful, okay? I remember many years ago meeting a young mother in the hospital in her thirties, not long before she died. At the time, she was busy writing a journal, writing letters to her then 11-year-old daughter to be read into the distant future. Oh, that's so beautiful, I said. What a legacy. No, it's not, she said. I'm just nagging her into the future. Still, just being a mom to the end. Sometimes it might even be an object that we cling to with such defiance as some kind of, I don't know, a, a touchstone to an aspect of ourselves we just can't surrender. Maybe it's an old wedding dress, maybe an old army uniform, maybe an old ID badge from a long gone career. Over the last few years of my mom's life, she was acutely aware that things would be wrapping up soon. And so she took to earnestly cleaning out, clearing out every drawer, every cabinet, every closet, letting go so that we wouldn't have to. When death finally came, things had been pretty much sifted down to the bare essentials, except for boxes and boxes, acres and acres of family photos, cards, letters, a few tattered newspapers with historic headlines, JFK assassinated that sort of thing. That last Saturday that we were packing up what was left of her life, I made a final pass through her bedroom closet and in the end of the darkness, high in the corner on the top shelf, I saw this hat box. How had we missed that? I pulled it out and opened it and I couldn't believe my eyes and I felt this searing stab of grief and amazement. It was the hat. This hat that had become legendary in my memory, her Donna Reed hat, I called her, I called it because she looked just like her when she wore it. It was a little pill box covered in champagne silk leaves, each one tipped with a tiny seed pearl. She bought the hat, I remember, to go with this light blue brocade suit that she would wear to her best friend Janet's second wedding at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas, maybe 1962 or so. My mom was quite the glamorous dresser in her day. Earlier that afternoon, in fact, I'd come upon the photo of the wedding party in the original Desert Inn folder. There my mom and dad were seated at the table, looking so handsome, so young, so beautiful. My mom was the only one at the table with a hat on, that hat. I also knew that under the table were the most stunning pair of pointed toe gold lame stiletto pumps. I had always been fascinated with my mom's high heels, obsessed really surreptitiously trying them on when she wasn't home. Even I knew better than to mess with those. But here it was, the hat. She had kept it. Though we reminisced often about those times, even about that outfit, she never let on that she had kept it. For decades and decades and decades after letting go, saying goodbye to everything and everyone else, she held onto that hat. Why? 
Did she need it as some kind of touchstone as proof that that time had been real, that that aspect of herself was true because that had still there up in that dark corner of the closet, unwilling to surrender this one last souvenir? It leaves me to wonder, what object will I cling to for no sensible reason as some kind of placeholder for some version of myself I will always want to claim as mine? I don't know. David Foster Wallace says, everything I let go of has my claw marks on it. And there are those who adapt quite well to loss, finding a new identity or a new version of the old one. I had so many wonderful conversations with Randy over the last few years of his life. He was in his mid fifties, had an aggressive colon cancer. Not long before he died, I was walking him out of the clinic and we're still chatting when we get out in the hallway and up walks another patient, gingerly making her way to the front door of the clinic. And Randy says, excuse me, Michael, just a minute. And he goes and he holds the door for her with a big smile on his face. There you go, sweetheart. He came back to me and said, you see there, Michael, the way I see it, that is my job now, to be kind. That's what I do. Now, Randy's professional life was one that had been animated by intense financial pressures and competition, commercial real estate. It had all been refined and distilled now down to that as one who shows kindness. Cancer had robbed him of so much, but it hadn't taken away that career opportunity. It didn't take away that place to still find some peace, some meaning. Kate, in her early 60s, was diagnosed with a recurrence of breast cancer, now stage four. Kate was a spiritual seeker, an artist, a musician. She played cello in a local chamber orchestra. While raised in Episcopalian, she converted to Judaism much later in life, but not because of marriage or any such conventional reason, but because she said, I love the humor in Judaism. And besides, there's no hell. She also loved the questioning nature inherent in Jewish study. Although any articulation about who or what is God, how does prayer work, what happens after we die, was simply left undefined because she experienced her spirituality in community, playing music in community, praying in community. She also shared with me she had been a survivor of childhood sexual assault, an experience that left deep wounds to be sure, but not the least of which was a crippling fear of dying. And the essence of that fear was, Michael, what if I just disappear? There it is, ultimate loss, disappearance. I asked Kate if she'd ever had what any of us might call a peak spiritual experience. Oh yes, she said, playing a big lush piece of music like Handel's Messiah. I got to play that once in Cleveland, full orchestra, chorus, the works. It was transcendent to be in the center of the creation of all of that music. Kate, you just told me that your biggest fear would be that you would disappear. And yet your peak spiritual experience was one in which you disappear, if you will, into the larger creation of this music. It couldn't possibly be about you and your cello in that moment. And yet without your cello, the music would not have been the same. What if dying is like that? What if the other side is like that? Surrendering into this larger harmonic reality in which our little voice is an inextricable link, a piece of the whole. She sighed into that, she exhaled into that. Sometimes we need to summon our imagination to come up with new images and metaphors when we find ourselves immobilized by the fear of loss. I love to hike. And for decades, I have made a nearly annual pilgrimage to Yosemite because there's one particular hike there that has simply given me my life back. There's no other way to put it. More times than I can count, oftentimes a great distress. About a dozen years ago, I came upon such a time, devastation really, spiritual crisis in fact, which I would define as a time of enormous loss. 
everything I had trusted and believed seemed to collapse right out from under me. And at first I thought, maybe I ought to go to Yosemite, do that hike, try to climb out of it, transcend it. But it just didn't feel right. And the more I thought, I thought, you know, you've always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, hike to the bottom. You're not getting any younger. What if instead of trying to climb up and out, you climb down into it, into the earth? See what might be there for you there. So that's what I did. For any of you who have ever made that descent, you know how staggering it is. And the wisdom that came to me was so clear and concise and profound. The Grand Canyon is only grand because of what's been lost, not because of one thing that has been added, one particle of soil at a time, letting go, releasing itself to the water over the span of five million years. It's incomprehensible, swept away by something so simple as water. I spent that night at the Phantom Ranch at the bottom of the canyon. It's a charming, historic, albeit Spartan compound, dormitory-like cabins, communal dining room. That night, the lovely gentleman who served us dinner asked for our attention before we dug in. He wanted to offer a kind of invocation or blessing. My friends, I wanna welcome you here. And I hope that while you're here, you take some time to be still and feel the power of this place, the magnificence of it, the sacredness, the majesty of it. It's like Jerusalem or Mecca for the native people. And he went on to say, and no matter how hard it was for you to climb down here today, climbing up tomorrow is going to be so much easier. And of course, there were incredulous groans from around the dining table. Yeah, right. And if not, he said, rejoice, rejoice, you got no choice. I love that. I come back to it again and again as a kind of mantra. Rejoice, rejoice, you got no choice. What if, like the Grand Canyon, we are being carved out for our grandeur, hollowed out by loss, so that on our descent down, we might catch glimpses of that which is indestructible. Sure, let's savor each vista, cherish each moment, hold on, you bet. But with the lightest touch and a willing any moment to let go, except perhaps, for that one thing, so be it. Thank you, Michael. Rejoice, rejoice, we've got no choice. That's gonna stick with me. Please join me in singing, There is More Love Somewhere.
As our service comes to an end, let us all extinguish our chalices, but not the light of faith, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, and our ever-present awareness of the wonder that surrounds and inhabits us. I invite you to perhaps close your eyes and let's take a few nice deep breaths together. Breathing in the love, the intention, the commitment of this community to come together and to connect despite all that there is now to separate us physically. As we exhale, can we release the light and the radiance of our coming together, not only back to one another, but to the larger circles of life. Let's even stretch our arms out right now where you're sitting and imagine our embrace of each other and those larger circles of life, getting a sense of our connectedness in a place beyond time and space despite the physical isolation of this moment. As we breathe into that embrace, can we also embrace that part of us that really wished for something else, something other than what we got? That part of us that does not want to let go, can we extend tender compassion to that part of ourselves even as life pulls much that we may love from our grasp? May we find peace in that delicate balance between holding on and letting go. So be it. We hope you've enjoyed Holding On and Letting Go, presented by Michael Esselin. Recorded on May 30th, 2021 for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura, California.